Metricast. When we consider that the natural complexifying force is inherent to existence, then I think the only way is up. And we might be, you know, if we want to think of it on a long enough timeline, maybe we're at a little dip right now, but the only way to go is up, uh, whether it happens now or in the near future. And so I think that's the natural direction of things. And we just want to perform and exist and act in alignment with that and, you know, toward that inherent good. I think that that's our own natural desires if we can fill up the hierarchy of needs and everything. So I think it's a natural product. I think the only way that that is the only direction things can go. I think there are souls that are specifically coming into the world at the moment to deal with those nuances, right? To deal with the, you know, the climate changes or the, you know, the world economic forum. That's another big topic that we could use an example here. Things like that, that yes, there are shadows, but there is light that is being, that is coming to meet the shadows. And I think that is really, that is the playground that we're on, right? That is the, that's why we're here. We're not just here to just be in the darkness. We're here to play in the darkness with the light that we are. Welcome, beautiful beings, to season two of the Cosmic Love Antenna podcast with your host, Harrison Ma. This podcast sets the loving intention of creating the mystical space needed to pull back the layers restricting health, alignment, and love. Now let's walk you home to your cosmic spiritual heart space. Before we continue, this beautiful chat today, wonderful souls. I need to jump in here to share something really exciting. If you've been following these episodes or you've been following me on social media, you know that I am in the process of releasing my first book, Your Cosmic Love Antenna, Define, Embody, and Emit Your Unique Frequency of Love. And at the time of this episode release, pre-orders are now open. If you have been pulled to this show if you're looking to understand the what the how and the why of love if you're looking to apply some of the tools connected to your chakras in a child releasing religious trauma ancestral healing emotional release and so much more then this beautiful expression from my heart to yours is for you if you are looking to channel more of your unique gifts and the divine frequency that you are these pages will open all of this up. And if you're interested, all you need to do is go to cosmicloveantenna.com. That's cosmicloveantenna.com. And you can pre-order this book right now. If you pre-order, click on that link, put in your email. You're going to get access to some special gifts that I'm only offering to those who get in before I release it fully. These gifts are going to be some more channeled meditations, activations, and some other surprises from my heart to yours. So head over to CosmicLoveAntenna.com, pre-order this beautiful expression, and I can't wait to hear how it shifts your life. If you're listening to this after pre-order sales, that same link can be also used to go to the direct purchase link. Sending love, and I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode today. Good morning, evening, afternoon, powerful beings, energized beings. Welcome back to the show and welcome back to a, another deep conversation into the mystical spiritual world. Today, I have a powerful man and a three-time returning guest coming back on the show. But before I get to him, as always here, as we start this conversation, a reminder for all of the new souls who are attracted to this chat and all the returning tribe members, if you get a lot of value out of this conversation today, please share this far and wide with someone you think it can give value to and insight to. If you have your own feedback, if this stirs things in you that you wish to share, the best way to do that is over on Spotify and Apple in feedback and reviews. And I would encourage you to stay to the end of this chat today because we're going to get into some very deep topics that i'll allude to here in a second and i'd encourage you to soak all of it up i had the pleasure today to welcome the powerful jay feldman back onto the show to have a discussion around some topics that i know that jay 
can go to with me. And there aren't many people on this on this earth, to be honest, that I, I feel comfortable enough really talking about these kinds of conversations with. For those new to Jay's energy, Jay is a health coach. He is an independent health researcher. He is the powerful co-host of the Energy Balance podcast, and he's a deeply wise soul. Today, we're going to talk about death culture, what it is, how do we overcome it, the fear around it, consciousness as a product of our physiology or something else, food choices, spirituality, modern concerns of how culture is being suppressed, and so much more. Jay, welcome back to the show, my friend. Thanks for having me here, Sims. Quite an introduction as always. Appreciate it. Well, Jay, I can't just I can't just mention your name and just leave it there, right? As I think as people who are familiar with your energy and either on your show or on mine, you know, you're quite the soul, my friend. So I, uh, the introduction is needed. The foundation is needed so people can open themselves up to you. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, uh, for people that are just listening, I really want to... I want them to share in a little bit of your frequency here at the moment, in this moment before we can begin this chat. You are in a a new home or a, no, a home that you're going to be sticking into around. Do you want to explain a little bit of your movements for people listening? Sure, yeah. So we've I've probably been in a different country, at least different location every time we've talked. Uh, <laughs> been doing some traveling over the last couple of years through uh, a few different countries in Latin America, and uh, we've landed in Ecuador and really enjoying it here. We spent six months here in the past, uh, or about a year ago, and decided to come back. It felt it feels like our place. So. Can I ask my friend, why does it feel like your place, right? And I ask this from a, a spiritual lens. Do you feel, obviously it feels like home, but can you break that down a little bit? Why does it feel so special to you? Well, that is actually one of the the main reasons when we came here the first time, especially this town that we're in, it felt like home from you know pretty early on and more, you know, on a completely different level than anywhere else that we've stayed. And we stay for, you know, we stay for a couple months in these different towns, but it, you know, has uh, a magic to it and it just feels right. Uh, we also feel like we have family here, just people that we've met and, and become close with and that didn't happen in other places. And I think we feel that with a lot of the the people here, it's a very friendly and welcoming place. So mm. uh, those are some of the biggest reasons. Can I ask Jay, cause I can't help myself. <laughs> Can I ask, uh, we haven't, we haven't spoken too much. I think people can allude to it from what you share, but I haven't, we haven't spoken too much about your spiritual practices. Do you, are you a meditator, my friend? Do you do you connect to prayer? Do you connect to how do you connect into your the bigger world in your daily routine? Uh, as far as daily routine goes, meditation would probably be one of the main things that fits in there. Uh, it's not something that has. There's periods of time where it's always in the daily routine, and periods of time where it slips away. And maybe part of that is because at some points, maybe I don't feel I need as much time with strict meditation. I think other times it's because life <laughs> uh, just happens and things, you know, we, our, our focus on that side of, of ourselves gets away from us. So there's, there's always some of that too. Uh, and there's other aspects as well. I mean, I think a huge component is also spending time in nature and that's something I prioritize and spending time in the sun as well. Uh, so yeah, those would fall in those practices. The reason I ask that, Jay, thank you for sharing. The reason I ask is, you know, the land, I'm sure you know this, but just to for people listening, and I'm using you as an example here, the, this land that you have a pull towards, it speaks, right? It speaks, it has its own voice. And right, and we, we don't even need to get into ancestors and lineage, and I'm sure that plays a component. But you know, Jay, maybe in the future, when you feel called, open up your heart to the land. Cause maybe, cause this feeling that you have of being in the space where you feel like home, in my experience, there's usually a deeper reasoning behind that. And how we can get to that reasoning is in a meditation, being on, being out in nature, like you suggested and asking, right. Asking mm, what, 
what do you have for me? Is there something here that I need to feel and acknowledge? Does that resonate at all, my friend? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the goal with, at least the way I, a goal that I think of when it comes to meditation is to practice that, that presence, you know, being present, practice that awareness. And so ideally it's something we can try to exhibit throughout our, you know, our entire day as opposed to just in that time. But uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, yeah, I think we need that to be able to tune into those things. Yeah. Which segues here into <laughs> one of the first topics I want to get into with you. And this, we, we were speaking about this before we started recording. I sent you a couple of messages yesterday and we were discussing, you know, diving into this. And the theme here is death culture. And I want to give a little bit of context just for people maybe new to this term or haven't heard it before. To me, what it represents is a culture that we live in that is very incessant on doing all the things and getting all the things in, whether it is within a day, a month, you know, years and a, a consecutive lifetime. And I think this has created a symptom within a culture where we're continuing to push and trying to get in as many different things because we're concerned about what happens. We're worried about this impending death. So with that context, my friend, I'm wondering if you want to speak to this and how this impacts maybe some of the work that you see in the world around energy and what we need to be mindful around. Yeah, it's a, it's, obviously a unique topic and something that isn't discussed very often, but I think there is a, an underlying fear of death in our culture. And I do think that is both a product of, but also something that is, that drives uh, a certain state of being. And so as you're kind of alluding to, if, you know, if we have this fear of, of an end, I think it, kind of like the opposite of what we were just discussing in terms of meditation and presentness is it immediately removes us from being present and, you know, requires us to, I don't know, I'm sure we can discuss on a few different levels, but on one hand, it maybe orients us toward doing everything we can to preserve ourselves, you know, to avoid death. Uh, We spend, we can spend a lot of time. Right, right. Yeah, we can spend a lot of time and effort and energy in life toward Every, you know, doing the things that we can do to potentially extend longevity. Uh, again, not to say that any of those things are inherently problematic, but uh, it's just kind of an orientation. I, I think there's, it also is one of those things that I think much like maybe any fear removes us from the present. You know, it requires us to uh, orient ourselves towards some particular destination or in this case avoiding a destination as opposed to the appreciation of the journey right i mean that sort of uh, kind of very cliche appreciation of the journey and not focusing on the destination but i think fear is something that very much pulls us away from that yeah it 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 to me it brings up it brings up many things but the thing that in reference to your work my friend that word longevity i i first was ex- was exposed to you when you were having a chat on the Ben Greenfield podcast, and for for people that are unfamiliar with Ben's work, he's a very powerful man and soul within the longevity realm, right? With biohacking and health, and it's interesting within this field of longevity, which I would actually count you a part of, my friend, within the work that you do around energy and 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 the bioenergetic view there is this desire to increase longevity by doing all these things, right? Whether it's the cold therapy, the hot therapy, the fasting, the, but in the act of doing all these things, like you just described, we're removing ourselves from the present moment. We're removing ourselves from the actual essence of life and that in turn, this is what I want to get your thoughts on here. This is the contradiction that in turn 
decreases our longevity, right? Because if we're focusing constantly on the on the future, what may or may not happen, that's causing us a lot of stress, is it not? Yeah, and that compounds when the things that we're doing in the name of longevity happen to also be drivers of stress. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and it, and another interesting dichotomy or kind of line to to walk here is, of course, there's I don't think there's an inherent problem with a desire to support life. Uh, I think we want to be in, you know, that that is an orientation that makes sense. That that does, I think, directly go with our biology is to support life. And as a part of that, I think doing things that would help to increase longevity would be beneficial. But I think there's a difference between acting toward that out of fear versus uh, out of a desire to support life or to provide or support others or something like that. Uh, so that's an, I think an important distinction, but also then we have the fact that many of the things that we're doing out of fear and to extend longevity aren't, you know, as a consequence are not doing so and are probably coming at a cost. Yeah. And that's actually one of the questions I wanted to ask you within this first little topic here, Jay. And I actually don't, expect you to have you know an in-depth answer around this i just want to see what comes up do you how much of this is is psychological fear like you just alluded to it but how much of it is you know the ego that is us the ego that we are the i define the ego as you know the self-expression the thought complex that we're made of how much of it is just that ego not wanting to die how much is it that ego projecting a persona or a belief onto our certain actions what comes up around that my friend do you have you had experience with starting to move into that world do you mean so how much of that is responsible for for what like for for our... this this sort of incessant you know getting lost in the future getting lost in this death process that is happening like we're i think you know, just to be clear with everyone, we're all dying right now in this moment, right? It's happening now. This is not a future thing. This is a now thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. And we're living at the same time, right? I mean, I don't think that we want to act as though there's no difference between death and life either. Um, and it, it's interesting, right, to, to think that both things are happening at the same time. Um, but just because death is maybe another phase or a something that we should that we want to come to terms with and face, maybe is is kind of a better way to to put that's, it and work through that fear. Yeah, that's yeah, the word. yeah. And that just so just because that is the case doesn't mean that it's not meaningful or that it isn't something that uh, we want to consider in, in importance. It doesn't mean that death, like death is meaningless. Uh, and, and so I know I'm veering away from your question, but I think that is something that we've, we see in all sorts of aspects of our, of our culture, even our nomenclature around it. You know, when we say that somebody passed away as opposed to somebody died, um, that's something that always bothers me is, uh, is it's, I think a, and again, most people are doing it unconsciously, but it's a mode of, a, of avoiding the, and avoiding facing that reality. Yeah. It's a reality we don't well, want to come to terms with. And, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think you're, this is veering away from the question at all, my friend, because this is how we, this is how we move through the psychological lens of this is realizing that our belief system around death is inherently flawed, right? It's out for most of us, death is an end, mm. but death is not an end, right? Let's just look at it from an energetic perspective, from an energy lens, right? Does en is energy destroyed? Is energy, does it end? In my experience, and I'm sure in your experience, Jay, the answer is no there. It's either moving or transforming into something else. So I think this is a definition game. This is a belief system game. I think we need to change. And this is what I was mentioning to you yesterday. I think we really need to look back at, again, going back to what we spoke about at the start, the land and the cultures that we've come from, how did they view death? Was death an end to them or was it something else? Yeah. Yeah. And 
I think along with that, with the reverence for it and the recognition that it is a shift, right? The idea that energy is not getting destroyed and that, uh, you know, considering the lack of separation between us, that we are all kind of continuing one life and, you know, as one system, one living system. Um, the the like with that i think we gain more of an appreciation for life as well you know the the irony is that when we have this fear of death that leads to uh to an, an orientation of of living in a way that's not really living which is just an avoidance and in fear uh and and it does I, what kind of brought a lot of this up was you know the you, you were we were talking after um i put out that episode about ray pete dying and Ray Pete had a great quote talking about the fear of death and the fear of losing loved ones. And part the kind of latter half of the quote was that he said that he, I'll paraphrase, but he basically said he thinks that it can help to think about it in terms of our lives as a continuation of theirs, that it's the same life with fewer bodies. And I know that that's kind of a concept that you're getting to. And I think he yeah. put that, you know, very eloquently. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you for bringing up that quote. I, I, I remember listening to it and I forgot about it and it's perfect. It highlights, you know, just for, again, for everyone listening, when we can understand, when we can zoom out this far, then suddenly our day-to-day choices, we put them in a different frame, right? We start to see that, you know, let me just get super practical with it. Every single day where I'm fasting, you know, to the extreme, maybe isn't needed, right? Every single day where I'm, pushing my body to 110% into the red, you know, maybe that's not needed, right? It's this beautiful balance, which I've used that word very intentionally. Uh, Jay, let's shift here to another topic I know you want to speak on today because I think it expands what we're saying here. And this understanding of death, we can sort of zoom back in now to, okay, is that the only challenge that we've faced (laughs) <laughs> is that the only sort of element that's going on? You messaged me this morning and, we, and you wanted to bring up the topic of let's maybe start with the suppression of culture through a couple of different lens, lenses, whether it be through consumerism, whether it be through the religion of science in certain degrees. So I'll, I'll throw it to you, my friend. Where do you want to, where do you want to start with this? Yeah, I think I think the fear of death and the kind of avoidance behavior that it drives is one of a handful of features of a very sick culture that we exist in. And there are a handful of other branches. And I think that this isn't by accident. I think that there's uh, re- there are reasons why our culture has been designed over time and developed in this way. And I, I think we see that become clear when we look through these different arenas. And so it's nice to kind of dig into these different aspects because I think it, be, it, it, it elucidates the drivers of how we're feeling on a day-to-day basis and how we exist that yeah. we aren't often aware of. Yeah. And the awareness, Jay, sorry to interrupt you, but the awareness, that's what helps us change it. Right. If we can see the thing that's unconscious, then we can make a different choice. Yeah. And when we're talking about a heavily imposed culture on a society, there's, I mean, awareness is a huge piece of it because it's making any change that requires massive shifts and, and movement in terms of thought processes and then in terms of action. And that's not going to happen without the awareness. And it's not, it, it requires a large scale as well. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm being pulled, my friend. I want to hear some of your thoughts around the the almost religious dogma around the Scientology science arena, because I know this is a world that you spend a lot of time in, right? And you so passionately. And again, I just want to plug for, for new people listening, I'd highly recommend you tune into Jay's beautiful podcast, the Energy Balance Podcast. And he does a really beautiful job of bringing the science in but highlighting it from different lenses and his perspective. So, you know, maybe we can break this down, Jay. Why do you think this is a challenge, the specific, you know, the religious nature of some of the dogma around it? 
Yeah. So we like to think of science as an objective, uh, an ob- objective uh, field, <laughs> but much like any others, it's influenced by many of the same powers that influence other fields. And as such, we, it's there is a an ideology that's been created throughout science through whether it's we're looking at physics or biology or biochemistry that uh, complex ideologies that dictate our current views of the world. And this involves modern medicine and involves nutrition science. And, and I think sometimes it's helpful to just point out some of the clear examples and then, uh, you know, we can explore how these things, how these devices essentially have effects on us as a society. Um, And so, and so, when we're talking about this in this way, we can be thinking of science as the, a, a new religion, meaning that it's something that's not based in necessarily fact, but in belief and ideology. And so sometimes it would be referred to as scientism. Um, you mentioned Scientology, which that's a that's an actual difference. religion. That's Thank different. you for correction. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's it's a funny. It, 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 that was a mistake on my part, but it is looking looking at it now. It's a funny connection there because you know, the reason I wanted you to speak to this is as the individual that's looking for answers, right? As the individual that's looking to, and maybe let's use the example to reclaim their energy balance and they want to look at the science. If they're unaware of this belief system that is very religious in nature, then one could get lost, right? One could get lost especially if that person, and this is what I want to get your thoughts on too, especially if that person isn't listening to their own body, right? If they are taking that science as the truth rather than their truth, right? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So what's the answer, Jay? Well, how do you, you, I'm wondering, how do you move through this? How do you, as a, as a science researcher, as someone who speaks on these topics, how do you balance out, you know, the dogma, the belief systems with the very real science that exists and, and then taking action and doing something new for your own being? So I think that is in many ways the answer. And so, and I know this is something we talked about probably in our last, maybe both of our last conversations, but the idea of anti-authoritarianism is a starting place because if we are in the mindset that we are going to outsource our beliefs on a topic to quote scientists or quote doctors or media or whatever it is, we are a preventing any sort of resistance to the the potential ideology there. And, and also we're, I mean, we're, we're left very vulnerable, I guess you could say. And, and, and so that's part one is, is the, is taking back that uh, autonomy, taking back the power to actually come up with your own beliefs based on evidence. And that requires taking time to think critically on different topics and expose yourself to different sources of information. And that's tough to do. And this goes hand in hand with other things we'll talk about, which is that we are, we have been suppressed as people to a point where we are supposed to be as like, we aren't supposed to have time and effort and energy to be able to put toward that. Uh, there's this, in this documentary I was watching, I think it was probably an Adam West documentary. I believe it's Adam West. Um, he was showing it. So that in terms of uh, marketing and propaganda, there was this, this, maybe it was from the 50s, this uh, report talking about how news and media were starting to put out stories that weren't factual, weren't entirely factual for some sort of gain, some marketing, publicity, public relations, those kinds of things. And they were basically suggesting that you create a chart and you grab all of the newspapers and you compare and contrast all of the, uh, like all of the different stories with each other. And then, you know, compare that with some, some other source. And then you're able to come to some conclusion, but you have to track it over time to see which Mm -hmm. ones you can trust. And it was this very complex, uh, suggestion, which at that time might have even been more reasonable, but to think that anybody is going to go through to that length nowadays to verify the source that they're using or the information that is that is coming across them is so far from reality. I mean, to the point where I think most people don't realize the beliefs that they're being indoctrinated with to even do that. 
uh, it's, I mean, we're so we're decades, literally many decades deeper, you know, into this problem at this point, into this web, this, um, this cultural suppression, you know, it brings up something here that I have to just have to throw in and I want to get your thoughts on. And it's connected to what you're talking about in terms of coming back to your own truth, right. And, and putting yourself first as the, as the beacon of, of truth in what you're taking in. It's the role of intuition, right? It's the role of our inner knowing, right? It's many of us, and this fits within the suppression topic we're speaking about here. Many of us have grown up in, in families, in a culture, in a world that doesn't, does, doesn't educate on the power of intuition the power of this inner knowing that we all have, right? We spoke about at the start of this chat about you living in this new place that feels good to you, that feels like home, right? That feeling that you're tuning into, it's not a belief system. It's not a, it's not a thought pattern. It's a, it's a sensing and a feeling. So I'm wondering, my friends, your thoughts on, you know, the lack of education and around this. And do you think this is, do you think it's intentional? Do you think it's a part of this cultural suppression? Oh, of course. And I, I think it's a part of our education too. I mean, you mentioned educa education. I think the current education system is oriented toward the removal of our own thinking. You know, it's not discussion-based. It's multiple choice-based. It's I, as the teacher, instead of teaching you how to think critically and learn, it's I teach you the fact and then you regurgitate it back to me. You have to remember them all. And that's, I think, a, just as much a part of the system as anything else. Uh, and it's a lot to break away from. I mean, there's, we'll talk about those other layers, I'm sure, too, because it's all, all of it together makes it really, really difficult. We are stuck in this uh, intricate web. Uh, and it starts from, it's, it is a part of every aspect of our society. Um, and just as a real quick footnote, I meant Adam Curtis documentary, not Adam West. <laughs> Adam West is the, isn't he the Batman actor? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice, it was a nice, it was a nice image regardless. Um, uh, it's, it's so interesting that came up because I was, I was calling you Mr. J at the start of this chat and I was actually, I was having some Batman imagery coming in. So it's funny that you picked up on that. Um <laughs> I want to jump to another topic here, Jay, but I want to check in anything else that you want to speak to around this cultural suppression. I know this was moving through you before our chat. So any other pieces you want to add in here? Yeah. I mean, it, like, I think that we are being assaulted on all angles here, right? It, we've talked about it in terms of education, or mentioned it in terms of education. We've mentioned it in terms of maybe some of the basics of science, but I think there's there's a handful of things. So in talking about things that occupy all of our time and effort and money, a huge part of that is that there are massive systems in place that market us, market to us, that convince us or propagandize us to think that we need to buy lots of things to provide an emotional response to become happy. And this is not by accident. When you look, you know, when you take a look at the history of these things, this, there was intentional shifts when advertising for a product at one point was just about the product's functionality. And then it became a situation where this is something that makes you happy or prevents you from being sad or makes you fit in with other people or accepted. Uh, and then we started using celebrities as faces for these products. I mean, again, this is there's we're so far past this at this point to the point where it's hard to sometimes discern what's an advertisement and what's not when you're watching a movie uh, and all of the you know product placement in there i mean we we have we don't recognize not only do we often not recognize these things but we don't recognize that this isn't quote normal or this isn't how it used yeah. to be and we're inundated at all angles to spend all of our money on these things to keep us as a cog in the system right to so a system that's creating dissatisfaction that we are trying to fill with consuming items or things and you know nice clothes nice cars whatever it is and then in order to do that we have to continuously work and again the estimates from you know 100 years ago about the advancements in technology were basically that we would be at this point working 2 days a week to you know because technology would have advanced so far that to create the same level of 
output, we would barely have to work. I mean, so much, so much can be automated and there's so much better farming practices and whatever the, the kind of ideas were. And we're only working more than that. Yeah. I mean, it, it, like massive amounts more than ever it's, before. It's almost as if there isn't a destination. <laughs> it's almost as if that this big machine that you just beautifully highlighted, all the different components of it, this this fits in perfectly to what we were speaking about at the start of this conversation around the death culture, right? That this is the machine that is exacerbating the death culture. This is the, you know, the animal, if you want to call it, that is that is keeping us. And again, we need to remember that we're in control here. But until we remember that, this is the this is the running. This is the treadmill that is keeping us in that unhealthy relationship with the death because all of these little components are making us or seemingly making us feel like we need that next hit right whether it's the food whether it's the the, the movie the celebrity the and i want to give a practical tip here and i'm interested to see how you deal with this my friend how i deal with this personally how i sort of snap myself out of the, I, I refer to it as the matrix at large, right? I just, I call it the matrix at large. How I snap about snap out of it is one, dropping into the presence that we spoke about earlier, but also in that moment, asking myself the question, honestly, do I need that thing to be enough? Do I need that food? Do I need that, 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 that mask of beauty? Do I need that hit of you know sexual interaction with that person to be worthy in this moment to be enough to be i would go as far as to say divine and that usually wakes me up i'm wondering how do you deal with it my friend how do you sort of detach and see the bigger reality yeah that sounds like a good technique. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything like that. Uh, I think for me, it's something that I've like, it's become a part of my life. Right. And, and, and this is partially out of necessity, right? Because so a recent, uh, let's say relatively recent aspect of this is buying clothing. So I've been traveling for a couple of years haven't, you know, I've been living in a suitcase with, you know, the clothes that I have. And so recently, you know, we're moving to this place where we're sticking around longer term and needed to buy some new clothes. And the, we can do that kind of unconsciously and buy whatever looks good or is inexpensive and cheap or whatever it is without, you know, recognizing the potential effects of that and recognizing that, well, normally when something's cheap, it's either made with very cheap material, which could come at a negative health effect potentially, or it's made with very, very cheap labor, which could come at a detriment to the people who are creating that item and recognizing that maybe I don't need 10, 15, 20 shirts, but I'm okay with three or four or five that are much more expensive, but are actually not built with slave, slave labor and aren't built out of petroleum products. And that's a, you know, and so you can do that with everything and become overwhelmed. And it's, it is overwhelming at first, but I think the more that we are active in our lives about what the, what we, what sort of things we choose to do with our money, which is huge. I mean, that's how, that's one of the main ways that we create action and vote toward something is, is with what we per, choose to purchase or not to purchase. Um, choosing, I think a huge one is, and again, this is part of the web, but not only do we typically not have time for these things, but we also don't have money to pay for the expensive things. We are, it's not always easy to find information about these things, but also we don't have the, it's, it's overwhelming to do all this in addition to uh, the overwhelm of, of daily life, among other things. And so it's something that I think we have to tackle one step at a time, but really evaluate our consumption in every way. Be careful anytime we're, so maybe this is like talking about techniques. Um, I think I, it's helpful to build in certain reflexes anytime that we are 
and this word is so overused, but triggered by something. So we were talking in, in the last episode about identity and trying not to identify with our beliefs. I think that can be something where if we, anytime that we're finding ourselves upset about something, I think that's an area to look inward or a time to look inward and explore where that's coming from and really be open to questioning ourselves and why uh, why we're holding a belief so strongly or why it's bothering us to consider the possibility that it might not be accurate. And that sort of practice, I think, is really, really helpful. And it becomes something that is natural, right, to question everything around us, to question everything that we do, to be very intentional about uh, our daily lives. And again, that this re often requires, this was the other thing I was going to mention, it almost always these things come at the uh, at the opposition or antithesis of convenience. So almost any time that we are choosing convenience, it's coming at the sacrifice of either our own health, safety, privacy, or the those of somebody else. And so I think we want to be really careful about choosing convenience and instead, you know, maybe try to be intentional about being a little slower with all of our choices and actions and being a little more calculated and intentional about them. Yeah. I think those are beautiful tips my friend and the slowness <laughs> again it's, there's this theme of presence that we're talking about here today it's only overwhelming if you're again projecting into the future right it's only overwhelming if within that using your example within that choice of buying clothes you 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 snap out of it and see the bigger reality but then you compare that bigger reality to all the other things you haven't, you have or haven't done yet, right? So it's it's always coming back. There's you're only ever in one moment. When you feel like you're not in one moment, you're not in the moment, right? You're you're out of it. Uh, I just I want to. I think again, it's hilarious that so many synchronicities happening in this conversation. I just had a conversation last night about my clothes, my friend, and my a a theme that we share together my parent my dad asked me how long have you had that shirt i was wearing a shirt and he's like how long have you owned that shirt and i didn't have an answer for him i couldn't tell him how long and it's because i do this it sounds like i do the same thing as you my friend i'm i'm so detached from just the clothing industry is one example of this big system that we're talking about that when i do buy clothes it's very intentionally like you outlined but I'm also, there's just such little attachment to, you know, what it looks like, what it is, how long I've had it. And I think this is, and I'm not saying everyone needs to be like this, but this is how we can start to view all these different pieces. It's what gives it out. What gives the power to the system is our choice to give it, give it power is our choice to, to become it, to, to put on the masks when in reality, we just need to take those masks off. <laughs> if, you, if you want to, to kind of put on paper the value of our attention, so that's what you're describing, like the value to these things is our attention. Consider how much money Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok make. That, they're, that is all based on our attention that we give those things. You're not paying to use those products. You are paying, or paying with money. You're paying with your attention. And you can see how valuable that is based on how much money they're making. Uh, and that is, again, another example of, of this web that is kind of keeping us stuck, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. Be beautiful example. It's attention is the new oil. It's the new, uh, it's, it's data, right? Uh, Jay, I want to shift here to another big topic I wanted to get to you, get to with you today. And you know, it it does it continues this attention and consciousness and this these big systems at play by now coming back in and talking about our individual system. And what I'm getting at here is in your world, my friend, from from your podcast and all the things you you teach about, you speak about energy a lot. You speak about uh, physiological energy balance and and what we can do to really optimize this and i'm not sure if it was the bray pete podcast or one of your chats one of your most recent chats but you were talking about physiological our physiological energy systems 
expanding consciousness, expanding the consciousness that we are. And what I want to get into with you in this moment is, is this, is our consciousness dependent on our physiological energy balance? And if it's not, what else is going on? So let's let, let's start with this. I want to see what bubbles up for you, and then we'll go deeper. So, what comes up for you around this, my friend? Yeah. Do you have an operating definition of consciousness, by the way? <laughs> Good question. I I would define consciousness as the unique frequency that we are. So, to maybe add a bit more to that, the unique frequency that we are is. I would connect it to the spirit that moves through us. So both the soul, the individual soul that we are, and the spiritual essence that we extend out into the world. That's what I would define as consciousness. Does that help? Yeah, sure, sure. So in short, I would say I, I absolutely think that our consciousness is the product of I don't want to, so I'll say physiology, but what that can, that can sound like I'm saying it is the product of some sort of mathematical equation, or it is the product of just our physical yeah. body. But when we consider that our physiology is directly, uh, again, with no clear separation, directly influenced by every other aspect of our environment, again, everything from the food we're putting in to the people we're around to the what's in the air that's around us and whatnot. So I do think it's in many ways a direct product of that and and our capacity for consciousness, I, I would look at as a phenomenon that's derived by a level of organization and structure. And that a, a basic principle within the bioenergetic view is, is that our capacity for organization and structure is the direct result of the energy that's available. And when we infuse energy into a system, it increases its organization. And you could say increases its consciousness as, as a result. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay. So this is, this is where I wanted to get to at this point. And now I want to ask you a question here. Mm -hmm. So I, so I agree with everything you just said, and I simultaneously disagree. And this is why. So, so I think I think there's an end to this. I think so for people listening at the time of this release, you most likely or you are interested in in getting my new book that's just come out. And in my book, I have I talk about these. I talk about these two energy systems. And I would define what you just talked about, Jay, as the mitochondrial energy system, that the the system that is dependent on all the things that you just said, the, the structure, the form, the food, the air, the terrain in many ways. Mm -hmm. But this is my question, my friend, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an example here. I, before this podcast and before the, what I'm doing now in the world, I was a personal trainer. And I would often see in the gym, I would see clients, they would fully push themselves to the extent of their mitochondrial capacity. So they would they would use all of their energy and they would do that, they would do the, the five sets on the on the on the machine and they would be depleted. They would be fully depleted. But then I would have certain clients that let's just call them they were more spiritually attuned and advanced. They would actually be able to tap into something else. They would be able to open themselves up and they all had different ways of doing it, but they would be able to open themselves up and actually push themselves beyond their physiological capacity or load and actually do another set and, and go further. And I classified that as they were tapping into something else. So I'm wondering, my friend, what are your thoughts on this? Do you, how would you describe in that example, what that person is doing? So I don't, so I think that we agree here, but in terms of the example, I yeah. think, so, so 
like as, as far as like mechanisms and understanding there, like yeah. for one, you know, we're, even when we're in the most, you know, intense workout and everything, we still only deplete our muscle glycogen so much, right? I mean, it's never really getting below 30% of its reserves. And um, most of our ability to activate muscles and muscle fibers has to do with our neural connections, right? The connection between our mind and our muscle. And so I think there's a, you know, if uh, so, uh, there's a, someone else who, his name is Brad Kearns. I've been on his podcast and something he always says is, you know, if, if I put a gun to your head, you can run a marathon. Like we have the, uh, like we have the power mentally, like you're, you don't need to train yourself to be mentally fit. Trust me. If you have enough motivation, like you're mentally, f- uh, like strong enough, you don't need to go through all these things to, to, f- you know, create mental toughness. That's kind of the context of that one. Uh, but I, so I think that in that example, that's the, those are the kinds of things that come to mind. However, and maybe we want to go through another example, but I think that there's just because, and this is kind of like the caveat I was trying to expand upon a little bit when I came to saying, I do think these things are products of physiology. So I don't think that means that it's as basic as you are this, like it is the product of this kind of stupid machine of our bodies, right? I think that there is a lot more going on, going on. Right. And I don't think that we are these, I think anytime that we treat ourselves as such or think of ourselves as such, we're missing some, some big factors. And I think there's a lot to consider. Like, I think that there's a lot that's not considered in basic health and nutrition and physiology that should be considered. And I think that's probably an area where you're referring to. Yeah. So thank you for going deeper there, my friend. I, like I said, I, I, this is, for me, this is just a sort of, don't want to call it a hypothesis, but a, a expanding understanding that I'll use the example of what I call this show, where I call this show the Cosmic Love Antenna. And I've shared this example with you before in one of our last chats, my friend. I really believe that's what we are, right? And like the antenna system, we have this innate frequency, if you want to call that our our deeper energy source that like an antenna system is dependent on the structure and the form to express it out into the cosmos. But, and this goes full circle to what we talked about at the start of this conversation, when the physiological form ends and dies, is there something that continues? Is there energy that continues? Is there potential that continues what comes up around this my friend yeah it's a great question um one that i wish i knew like a a good answer to you know or or like really knew the truth uh, or whatever that truth is uh but i do think that what does your heart say my friend what do you yeah i mean so i think quite literally we are always in interaction with the beings around us you know there's a lot to be said for the field biology the the idea of of measurable energetic fields around organisms also within organisms. And this is something that uh, took a long time, but has started to be more acknowledged in certain instances, like uh, in growth and development of a fetus, that there's recognition that actually a lot of it is, is driven by fields as opposed Mm -hmm. to the reading of the genetic map being the kind of contrary idea that everything is just like kind of building these blocks together, but rather it's a lot more uh, artistic, you could say, uh, and so I think there's a lot to be said for that. And and we talk, you know, when we talk about memory and the complexity of memory, I mean, there is no like part of a neuron that holds a particular memory or something. It's, it's quite, I mean, it's, in, it's so complex that we don't have, yeah. you know, in our current terms, any way of identifying it or in our current tools and measurements, any way of identifying how a memory is held. Uh, and then we come to the fact, and I think we brought this up earlier, the fact or the concept that a memory can be passed down, yes. you know, the, the rats and the fear of, I think it was yeah. they, the mice that were made to fear cat urine and that fear being passed down. And I mean, it's, there's a lot of complexity here that I don't think we yeah. have measure or understand. And, and I think this is one of those two. And I do think in a literal, or I guess maybe in a physical sense, there are um, again, there's so little separation between us. Like we're so interconnected, quite physically interconnected that I do think that there's something to that idea that, that it, 
maybe in some ways very much is a situation where our lives do continue on in the bodies of others. And yeah. Have you, Jay, have you look in, looked into the work and the science of Rupert Sheldrake? Do you know who that is? No, no. Have you heard of the term morphic field? I don't think so. So I, I, I bring that up because uh, the memory element that you are just speaking about, the passing of the memory and the cells almost connecting into this one mind, uh, the work of Rupert Sheldrake and this idea of a morphic field, the science being done around that really explains some of that, that there is this, there is this, and this connects to this next topic I want to speak to you about here. There is this consciousness, uh, again, if you want to call it a field or a layer that we tap into that holds the memory that, that we're all connected to, whether you want to call it the one mind or the, you know, the oneness that we're connected to God, whatever the name, there is this field that we sort of, we come back into and come out of that holds, holds the memory as one example. I'll have to dig in. I'll have to, yeah. I'll have to check them out. I, Jay, I'm, I'm really enjoying this conversation and I really appreciate the soul that you are going deep into these topics. And I, I hope it's bringing value to people listening. The, the last topic I want to hit on here today. And I know that to plug, to plug your beautiful show again, I foresee you doing some deep dives on this, on this conversation. It's the difference between uh, competition versus cooperation. And we spoke about it a little bit in our last chat. Uh, is it, it's Darwin and it's Lamarck, right? Is it Lamar or Lamarck? Lamarck, yeah. Lamarck, yeah. There's a, this is a whole conversation, but I want to pull out the component of inherent good versus, again, this system that we can always get lost in that is the matrix that seemingly opposes that. So what comes up for you, my friend, on this idea of inherent good within this Darwin versus Lamarck worldview so I'm maybe in the context, what, yeah maybe in the context of what we've been speaking about thus far sure yeah i'm curious to hear what what you view as an inherent good but it, it what comes to mind when i think about that comes back to the idea of the natural direction and this is actually something that lamarck talked about was this natural complexifying force that drives us toward greater capacity, maybe greater consciousness, greater complexity. And I think when I view inherent good, it is A, the presence of that directional force and B, the idea of encouraging it and doing things to yeah. support it. Uh, and that involves supporting life, you know, the existence of life. It, and it involves supporting the people around us and everything else. And we, I mean, these are kind of extensions, but I think that's... Uh, that's what I think of when I think of inherent good. Yeah. And it's, so to me, what it brings up to answer your question, one of the reasons that we get stuck in competition versus cooperation is one, we think we're separate. And as we've talked about today, <laughs> I think if you've, if you've reached this far in the episode, you can start to see that's not a reality, but so it's separation, the illusion of separation. And two, it's scarcity, right? It's, it's the, uh, another limiting belief that is, that is pervasive in the collective is that if Jay, let's use the example of a podcast, right? If Jay has X amount of people listening to his podcast, that means I'm going to have that X amount less listening to my podcast, where in reality... That's not the case, right? Just from a logical perspective, all those people might be interested in this show, but in a energetic lens, we are in an abundant universe. So to me, inherent good where this comes in is as the individual that is a part of the collective, my individual actions are always adding to that collective, right? I, when I'm inspired, and I'll use the example of this show that we're doing today. When I'm inspired to talk to Jay about these conversations, this isn't just a conversation that me and you are having. This is a conversation that me and you are having a part, a part of a collective that's connected. So 
our individual actions, our inherent good, is adding, is adding to the field, is adding to the bigger collective. Does this resonate with you, my friend? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Definitely. And I think you had mentioned the scarcity and we kind of talked about this a bit last time and, and you had alluded to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I think is an important concept here, which is that and ties in with what we kind of started out with, which is we have a web that puts us into a place of scarcity in terms of emotional and physical health, in terms of financial comfort and in every way, social health, all, all of those things. And so I think, and that is a real thing to exist in that scarcity. And I think that that inherently detracts from our desire or our capacity for driving toward that inherent good. And so creating abundance is an, involves a mindset and also involves action or environmental aspects that allow for us to naturally be in a place where we can further support uh, and create that inherent good and complexifying energetic force. And we can help other people get to that point too, right? I and mean, that's, that's a huge part of it is trying to provide that for others or, or help other people provide it for themselves. Yeah. yeah. The, the saying that comes into my head as you're sharing, my friend, is high tides rise all boats, mm -hmm. right? And it's this idea that by us coming together to collaborate, to connect, to share ideas, to communicate, to break down topics, you know, like we've done today on the show, we are rising together, right? There's, there's, there's not... Jay is getting something and Harrison or Harrison is just getting something. No, our, our hearts come together to create a bigger effect. Right. And then we all benefit from it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is coming back to the kind of start of, the, of what you had asked. That is something that does not jive with the neo-Darwinistic view. And that's part of the reason for the neo-Darwinistic view is to encourage an agenda that basically tells us a couple of things. One is that any kind of inequality or injustice that we see is the result of, you know, in, in terms of humans and people is the result of bad genes. There's nothing yeah. we can do to change that. And our genes are naturally selfish and that their only desire is to further their own reproduction. And that might come at the cost of somebody else. And that's just biology. Uh, you know, only the fittest are going to survive and reproduce. And that's, that is the only way forward. And along with this, and one of the kind of big pieces here is that these things are on one hand predetermined, largely predetermined that there's nothing to, that can be done to change it. Uh, and any change that does happen is, is very, very slow, but it's also entirely random in that there's no direction to it. There's no impact of it or, or impacting it. It's just going to happen on its own and there's nothing we can do to change it. And that is a belief system that's uh, kind of driven biology in many ways yeah. and is something that is another piece of that web that is meant to make us feel powerless. more or less helpless. Yeah, helpless, powerless in our current state and that we are not cogs in the system because there's been some form of exploitation by a small group of individuals who happen to have all the wealth. They just happen to have that because they're smarter, because they have better yeah. genes and all of that. And on and on among all the other things, uh, all the other manipulation that goes on, th those things have nothing to do with it. It's, it's, you know, we are where we are because of our, of our genes. And that is uh, another kind of deep uh, aspect of the web, a deep thought process that um, exists throughout science or at least through biology and genetics that uh, yeah. yeah acts in that way. What I'm really grateful for is the collective at large. If you compare, you know, everything we've talked about today, I think this is a nice place to wrap up this conversation. If you compare all the themes that we've talked about today, if you would express them with someone 50 years ago, the degree in which they, the difference between them waking up from them being asleep to them waking up, the, the, the leap would have been a lot more grand 
than what it is now. I think I feel, and this is what I want to get your thoughts on the collective that we are. This is no longer, this is no longer jiving with most of us. Even if we are only just waking up, there are still parts of most souls now that are familiar due to the work that others have been doing due to the work that the rest of the collective has already done. So I'm wondering if you've seen this, my friend, have you seen that the collective that we are is either is, is waking up more and, or is starting to realize that, Oh, this is, this is no go anymore. This, this is, we don't need to have this conversation anymore because I know what the real truth is. (laughs) So I think, I think there, there is some truth in that. I think one of the probably unintended or just one of the consequences of us being as connected as we are through technology and the internet and all of that is being able to, and being able to freely share ideas is that it has led to the ex, kind of exposition or, or the presentation of a lot of information that could not have been shared as easily prior. And that's huge. And I do think that, that it, we have more, potential access to that than ever before. But at the same time, we have more potential access than ever before to the fake version of that, um, to the version where, to the version where somebody thinks that, and I'm not trying, I'm like, who am I to say, but I, I think that there is a large portion of, of the world now where we are, where we think that we're awake and we, and in reality, it's just the next layer of the matrix, right? We've woken up in another matrix and we think that we're out, but we're actually still in the matrix. <laughs> and this is, and it's tough, right? I mean, this, it's, it, it just takes, I think, I think it comes back to a awareness, but B commitment to questioning critical thinking and all of that, because I think that's the only way out. But I think that, we, we don't realize how much we've been, it's been stacked against us. And just to like throw out a couple of short examples here, I think, or maybe one that's, that's a, a clear one is when we look at a huge aspect of the feminist movement, which of course the idea that women and men should be equal in terms of their rights and everything is, is, you know, like Mm -hmm. totally justified and understandable, you know, movement. But I think what happens is that movement became hijacked and was used Mm -hmm. to further agendas that actually not only didn't help women, but didn't help humans as a whole. One example of that is, is that it created a situation where the introduction of women into the workforce to the same level as men or equal degrees has now allowed for situation where we can, where the wages on average can be reduced so much that now it takes two people of a household to make the same amount as one person before. And we think that we're better now, but in reality, we have just created a greater transfer of wealth and put ourselves into further indentured servitude in a way mm-hmm. under the skies of it being about women's rights. Mm-hmm. And there's layers more to that. I'm kind of like keeping it yeah. you know, service level, but that is, I, I think, an example where we think that we are doing something for like to make a great change and often the intention is there, but it's being hijacked and and manipulated by larger forces. And I think there's very similar things going on with climate and environmental activism where again, I'm fully in favor of supporting our environment and stop. Yeah. Yeah. And stopping the destruction of the Amazon and our food and water and air supply. I mean, it's like the extent to which, you know, the pollution is happening is, is terrifying, terrible. But I think most of what's happening currently in that movement is not actually stopping those things. And instead we've created a scapegoat and something like carbon dioxide and oriented everything toward that. So we're not concerned about pollution because we quote offset our carbon footprint sort of thing. And, and so I think there is a large portion of people who, you know, get swept up by that and understandably so. Um, But I think that's what, why we have to come back to the, the, yeah, the anti-authoritarianism, yeah. critical thinking and exploration and questioning beliefs and all of that. I think that's our only way through. And that's why I really enjoy having these chats with you, my friend. One of the reasons, other than the fact I get to see a new setting in your background every single time of where you're living, <laughs> but also because it's, it's these nuances where the wisdom lies, 
right? It's it's. I agree that I think the matrix is getting more, uh, if you want to call it, shifty and more complex in its illusion. But that complexity is also creating more conversations, right? That complexity is creating more conversations around, you know, the climate, our biology, our, you know, the wars in the world, et cetera. So, yes, I do agree. I think that the the illusions are expanding, but a nice little output of that is differing conversations that would not have been there before. Right. Mm-hmm. I think as an example, right. I think there are souls just to get super spiritual here as we wrap up. I think there are souls that are specifically coming into the world at the moment to deal with those nuances, right. To deal with the, you know, the climate changes or the, you know, the world economic forum. That's another big topic that we could use an example here. Things like that, that, Yes, there are shadows, but there is light that is being that is coming to meet the shadows. And I think that is really that is the playground that we're on, right? That is the that's why we're here. We're not just here to just be in the darkness. We're here to play in the darkness with the light that we are. Yeah, I agree. I definitely don't mean it for it to sound doom and gloom or all doom and gloom. I think there's a lot of opportunity right now. I think we do have a lot of potential power and potentially more than ever before. I mean, I think the potential for organization on large scale is is greater. I think that our ability to share information with each other is greater. I think those things are massive and will at some point lead to breakthroughs, massive yeah. breakthroughs, I hope. And yeah. Yeah. Jay, I think. <laughs> sorry, but just your show is an example of that, right? The work that you're doing in the world, right? The work that I'm doing in the world, they're examples of that. Right. And it's why we're here in many ways. Jay, I want to thank you for your presence and your energy and the soul that you are in this world. If people listening want to find out more about you, they want to tune into the work that you're doing. We've already talked about your beautiful podcast, the Energy Balance podcast. Do you do you have any offerings on in this world? I know you do a lot of group coaching. Where do you want to direct people if they want to find out more? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So my podcast is called the Energy Balance Podcast. If you head over to my website, which is jfeldmanwellness.com, there are free articles, links to the podcast. If you check out the services tab, you can get in contact with me there. For I do offer one-on-one, one-on-one coaching. I have an energy balance course, and I do offer group coaching as well, which that one's not on the website quite yet, but maybe by the time this is up. And uh, as a really good starting place, and I think I probably mentioned this in the last couple episodes, uh, I have a free mini course that listeners can sign up for at jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And I go through in that mini course, practical steps from the diet and lifestyle side for increasing our energy production and how that relates to various symptoms and uh, physical issues we might be dealing with. But of course, it ties directly in with everything we discussed today. So Beautiful. And as always, wonderful listeners. I'll put all of Jay's details in the show notes. So with it, whatever play you're listening to, click the details and you can go straight to those links. Jay, I love you very much, my friend. Thank you for spending time with me today. I want to tune in to your heart. Any final words that you want to share with people listening, maybe around some of the topics we've spoken about today or just some inspiration that you want to share? <laughs> I do mean it very genuinely when I mean that I don't think it's all doom and gloom. And maybe that's an important thing to mention is just, I do think there's lots of opportunity. I do think we can be more connected now than ever. And I, I think that that, I also think that when we consider that the natural complexifying force is inherent to existence, perhaps, then I think the only way is up. And we might be, you know, if we want to think of it on a long enough timeline, maybe we're at a little dip right now, but the only way to go is up, uh, whether it happens now or in the near future. And so I think that's the natural direction of things. And we just want to perform and exist and act in alignment with that and, you know, toward that inherent good. I think that that's our own natural desires if we can fill up the hierarchy of needs and everything. And so I think it's a natural product. I think the only way that that is the only direction things can go so and to give you some extra love jay i think there's a difference between being doom and gloom and bringing awareness to the shadows to then alchemize them 
And I think that's what you do very well, my friend. So <clears throat> thank you for being here today. Beautiful listeners. Thank you for bringing us your attention, your time, your energy. If this brought value today, please share this far and wide. But regardless, as always, Jay and I love you unconditionally. And until next time here on the show, we'll see you again very soon. Bye, everyone. Before I leave you today, beautiful beings, I'm so excited to share a special announcement just with you. On the 20th to the 23rd of April, 2023, I and a fellow guest of the show, the beautiful Ali Paws, will be hosting live in Tulum, Mexico, the Cosmic Heart Tour. If you listen to this podcast week to week and you resonate with my frequency, with my voice, with my love in any of the topics I share with you, then most likely it is time for us to connect and heal in person. So I invite you to join us in Mexico. Join us for some meditations, activations, yoga, cranial sacral therapy, a book release, a live Q&A, poetry, and so much more. These spots are going to fill up super quick because our intention is to make this exclusive and intimate. So please DM me, Cosmic Heart Tour, on any of my social channels. That's Cosmic Heart Tour on any of my social channels, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, and we'll book in a meeting so you can join the love. I'm so excited to connect with you in the flesh. Thank you for listening to the Cosmic Love Antenna with me, your host, Harrison. If you gain value or this episode hit your heart, please remember to share this out with a friend, a family member, or a lover. You can also leave your love over on Apple Reviews and Spotify Star Feedback, and this helps me spread my frequency to more souls in need. Finally, if you want to connect with me deeper, want to reach out, interested in coaching, please follow me on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and LinkedIn at Harrison Ma, Ma spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R. Sending you so much love.